Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are talking about dark storytelling, whether it's the book you read under the covers or a good campfire ghost story. The Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or just about any podcast platform. So what makes a good noir or dark read and what goes into writing it? You mean besides the occasional blood sacrifice? (laughs) So we really can't give away all the secrets up front because, I mean, honestly, what fun is that? We will be right back to all the scary stuff. First, we want to let you know where you can find us in person in the next few weeks. And a reminder, you can purchase tickets for all of our live events at ParanormalScienceLab.com. This Saturday, November 19th, we have two events. First, in the afternoon, we will be at Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, signing books and talking about everything in the dark Ozarks. This is a free event, by the way. And then the night of November 19th, we will be doing a tour and paranormal investigation of the Web City Public Library. Find all of the details for the events at ParanormalScienceLab.com. And now you can get your Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at DarkOzarts.com and ParanormalScienceLab.com. So what is scary, whether it's paranormal or not paranormal? Well, what makes a modern dark fairy tale and how do you write it? Wait, you did write a modern dark fairy tale, do tell. (laughs) (laughs) I did. And let's start there. As soon as we give a shout out to our great sponsors who help us bring the Dark Ozarks to everyone. We encourage everyone to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com, for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more, not to mention it's haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. And we also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English-style brewery in Missouri and twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, that building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Well, dark fairy tales and modern dark fairy tales. Um, You wrote one. I did. 2018 published Plague Child's Doctor, my my first full-length fiction work. Not my first writing rodeo by any stretch of the imagination. I had already written hundreds of articles for State of the Ozarks, written a lot professionally prior to the founding of State of the Ozarks in 2007. And during that process, had the opportunity to write some short stories for the magazine Mm -hmm. available on stateoftheozarks.net. Interest, uh, not surprisingly, anytime that I wrote a short fiction piece, it was always noir, folklore it it just came naturally yes yes it did (laughs) one uh came to me in the middle of the night I had to get up and write it in the middle of the night because it just the story was in my head and I had had to at a very inopportune time mind you because it had been three very long days at War Eagle and I had to get up and be ready to ready to rock and roll and go to church the next morning. And here it is, midnight. Uh, and and uh, and I'm typing away, sitting on my bed with the laptop, typing away, because I have this story in my head that I have to get out. And boy, howdy, is it creepy! Uh, it's called James Footprints. It's been yeah. featured a number of times. Also featured. I usually it gets featured on social media. In, uh, during the Halloween season on State mm-hmm. of the Ozarks, State of the Ozarks. And then uh, life in general did a couple of wonderful things. One, I was challenged to create the novel because I had been asked to teach a novel writing class and I had not written a novel. So 
there was that. And, and you, thought, you didn't want to be one of those people who, you know, doesn't, so they teach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is very true. And I, it was, it, 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 there's a lot that really went into that, but I, I was provided with text, with a text for the, for the class. And, and it, this was a, uh, for, students approximately 12 to 16, 12 to 18. Um, it was a fairly large class and I was provided with the text, did not like the text, um, bought my own text, no big surprise there. And then a couple of weeks before starting the class, I started the novel and it, it was very, to me, it was very, it was humbling. It was very uh, egalitarian. And I, and I was very upfront with the students. I said, you know, these are my writing credentials. That said, we're basically all going to be writing together. I will share my pitfalls and struggles as we go. And then you guys can share your stuff. But basically, I, I go first. Uh, here are the things that I'm dealing with in this creative process that are challenges. And then there's an open door for you all to share. But because I've shared my difficulties first, it should make it easier for everybody else. And that seemed to go well. It was a very popular class. And in the process, I wrote Plague Child's Doctor, available on Amazon, Barnes and & Nobles, and, uh, of course, available in person on, uh, at, on, on November 19th at Always Buying Books for our upcoming Saturday book signing. Yes, plus available on darkosarts.com. Yes, and uh, and uh, <laughs> where generally speaking, wherever we're at providing, I remember to bring them. There is a running <laughs> joke that I keep forgetting that I wrote a book. Uh, I didn't, I don't forget that I wrote it. It is psychologically for me, there, I do a lot of writing for for work mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm, I'm proud of that I'm happy to do that I'm happy to be a professional writer uh, and author but for me Plague Child's Doctor was a personal art piece and mm -hmm. and perhaps other creative people have had some of the same issue perhaps not uh, but once I created my art piece, then I'm like, okay, I'm done. And psychologically, I, I'm just like, well, my work is done. So now I'm happy. Well, and, you know, I think that, I think that uh, illustrates one thing um, that happens to a lot of writers. A lot of creative people are not good at marketing or feel embarrassed to market their own work because they feel yes. like it's vanity um but it's not because that's how people become aware of any sort of art piece in any media it is it is and <clears throat> for for me it is easy for me to be self-effacing about the work i'm i'm an excellent marketer for lots of other things as, mm -hmm. as evidenced by study of the Ozarks. But it is interesting, and there's a little bit of this that I don't ever want to lose for me, which is that the book was and is a personal art piece. Well, and, and, I, and I agree with you. I, I, I struggled with, with that with my books um, <laughs> for quite a long time because it's just like, a, you know, you hate, you, hate to, you hate to pander your own work. And um, yeah. But uh, over time, I just came, became a little more comfortable with if, if people are interested, fine. If not, I understand. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I also look at it that creating, creating art and then putting it in a drawer or closet doesn't do much good either. So, Which is a really good point. And, and I think each of these steps are, are important. Uh, and, and are applicable to artists, not just writers, uh, but artists and creatives across the board. And, uh, you know, stepping into that 
in that space to say, yes, we get it. You created this because you had something to create. And now let's take it another step. Let's take it another step. Exactly. Um, coming back to our modern uh, dark fairy tales. Um, yes. One major um, theme that you deal with in Play Child's Doctor is basically real magic written fictionally. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And I did, uh, I, I would say, a, a considerable amount of research in creating um, a, as much of it as possible. It was very important to me. We uh, include a number of magical disciplines. And I think I think for for those listening um, who have not read the book, it's um, it may be helpful to note that th this is this is not a world building exercise per se. This you 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 are dropping the themes of basically fairy tales and folklore into a real setting and taking aspects of craft as it actually has been used and dropping them in. It is, it's my goal is to create as realistic uh, a first person experience as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, try that I, <clears throat> as, as, a, as a lifelong reader and as a lifelong, a nearly lifelong writer, there's, it's always a challenge, but it's a fun challenge to say, mm -hmm. Let's pull the things that you like. Let's skip the things that you don't, uh, and see how these things these things work. Since it, just in order to contextually frame it, I am going to share the description, the book description from the back of the book, so folks will have a little bit of an idea. It's not going to be a character a, a, a narrative summary. If you want a summary, you can get the book. Uh, but also, uh, we are going to be talking a lot about your books as well. This is this is the um, the subject of, of tonight's episode is noir writing and dark um, novels and the the whole the whole thing and and probably dealing with some of our favorite mm, inspirational writers as yes. as well in this whole process. But the back description, which I had struggled. I'm just coming back into the creative process, but I had struggled for a really long time, comparatively speaking, about what the back of the book was going to say. <laughs> and I was doing something else. I think I was driving somewhere. And all of a sudden, like all of these little lines start dropping into my head. I'm like, that's the book. That's the, the back cover synopsis. So I like pulled over, wrote it out on a napkin and then, you know, included it. So um 14 and, that, and that's how the, yeah. and that's how the creative process works at times you know it it rarely the obviously you can create blocks of time to create but the actual process tends to be very asymmetrical mm -hmm. it is for me too <laughs> and and, uh, and so just to set the stage uh for the fiction piece and to frame the folkloric and magical sections 14 year old cyrus thatcher already knows he's a freak and his father hates him. But when his beloved baby sister disappears and the townspeople won't help, Cyrus must choose to take matters into his own self-doubting hands. Set in rural Missouri in 1924, Plague Child's Doctor is a fanciful plunge into fantasy, horror, and Americana where nothing is as it seems. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a good description. Good. I, the, a, a couple of points dealing with the magic aspect and then dealing with these larger themes, particularly of Celtic mythology and Celtic folklore, which I drew heavily uh, from, mm -hmm. is that line where nothing is as it seems. The overarching theme or themes that I really wanted to play with uh, throughout the book were themes of ambiguity and themes of duality. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, of course, you know, the, those are the line, those are the aspects where mystery and suspense come in, even if it is a folkloric tale. And it, it is uh, certainly an area that in real life we deal with consistently. Uh, interestingly enough, 
you know, two years after the book was published, we we're echoing some of these themes with the tagline of Dark Ozarks. Sometimes there are no easy answers. The reality that sure. you can look at these things this way and that way and ever which way, but sometimes at the end of the day, you look at the data that you've compiled, you look at the anecdotal evidence, you look at the, uh, uh, the interviews, and you just have to step back and say, we don't know. And that's okay. That can be okay. Yes. I, I, interestingly enough, and I think this is a you know, mind-bending point for, for some people, is that there's actually a lot about the everyday world that we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know how my cell phone works. It just does. <laughs> And, and that's okay. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of things I don't know how it works. Same. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, but we, we struggle when it gets into some of these sometimes more cosmological or existential questions. We're like, no, we need to know. No, maybe we don't. Maybe it's okay that we don't know. And certainly uh, real magic fits into that odd space it does and it and in it, it has through time fit in that space in that role uh it, it's a very modernist 20th century concept that we have we have to have every box closed and every t crossed and i dotted and we we have to have an explanation for everything or somehow we're lacking Yes, <clears throat> or that we are somehow lessened uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that we're, we're unsafe, that the, the world is off kilter and we can't get our balance. I, I think it's a matter of almost that uh, it's an admission that, that we haven't conquered, conquered the world completely. And it's a very 20th century concept that we have. Yes, it is. It is. And it's it, the possibly one of the reasons I like magic is because it makes the world much bigger again. Mm -hmm. That's true. As, as the world has shrunk, uh, a lot of the mystery, um, even though the mysteries are still there, we pretend they aren't. Um, and then when radio and then television and then the internet came along, <laughs> Instead of why, in, in some aspects, it can widen your world, but in other aspects, it becomes even more microscopic, it seems. <laughs> it really can. And <clears throat> speaking of, you know, putting things in boxes, there's a, a consistent theme coming back to the ambiguity, the duality, to me is such a, a powerful element of the Celtic soul. Uh, the, the Celtic worldview, or it would probably be more appropriate to say world's view, uh, plural, the, the, the view of many worlds, not just one, not just mm -hmm. ours. And something that you see as a, a narrative ripple throughout Western civilization is the conflict between the, the, the mindset of the open-ended Celtic curve mm -hmm. versus the Roman cube, uh, everything within a grid, everything within a box. And of course, we can still trace those grids and boxes uh, across Europe mm -hmm. in, uh, in the road systems and the aqueducts uh, that have survived the, the Roman Empire. But I, and we I still argue, build our we still build our cities based on the 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 format that ancient Rome created. Yes, we do. And uh, I think, you know, I, I continue to postulate a, a, yeah, an argument that the Roman Empire didn't really die. Uh, the, the, the Roman Empire uh, changed, uh, mm -hmm. it changed faces. It did not change its harder structure. Uh, began uh, certainly from a, you know, a, an aspect of things like um, the Holy Roman Empire, which was, of course, the, the great joke. It was neither holy nor Roman. 
um, the, uh, uh, the, the end of an empire uh, or kingdom mm -hmm. uh, with the Plantagenet family. And then, and then ultimately with the, uh, uh, the Norman invasion of Britain creating the, ultimately creating England and the United Kingdom unification 1800 and then the essentially American empire of which we're mm -hmm. um, loyal citizens thereof of the uh, of the great empire is just a, a long continuation uh, of, of essentially the same concepts the same ideas the under different names and different people and different mm -hmm. reactive responses but it is this concept of everything within a grid everything within a cube the celts and the celtic peoples in north of the alps and in modern day in, uh, Br great britain and ireland the these peoples saw things very differently and they reflected mm -hmm. the what they saw how they saw it in their art which of course we've been able to unearth in in many cases and learn a great deal about their perspectives as many people already know the celts did not have a written language to to share so it's very difficult for us to read word for word celtic mythology like it is with greco-roman mythology because they had the decency to write things down uh, the Celts did not, but because it was a, a incredible and highly complex oral tradition, uh, pardon me, amongst the nomadic horse lords of North of uh, North Central Europe and and into Britain, but we can discern so much of their perspective, and of course apply that, and it it resonates particularly for those of us of Celtic origin to go back to those those roots and look at the art. Uh, the mm -hmm. art from Hallstatt, the art from Laten, the art from numerous sacred burial sites uh, mm -hmm. across Europe and into, uh, well, across Europe. And to look at that art and realize that they are communicating their, their worldview just as though they were writing it down with words, they're communicating it with their art. And you see it with the Celtic knot that begin that has no beginning and no ending. You see it with the with the exquisite Celtic curves that refuse to fit into a cube, a block, a square. They are open ended. They are open minded. They lead the mind into multiple worlds. Uh, obviously, this is not Norse culture, although Norse culture uh, and Germanic northern german germanic cultures did impact the celts and vice versa mm -hmm. but it does remind me of the nine realms of the Yggdrasil, the great ash tree that wow. there's just an openness of of narrative that mm -hmm. you some people can find very unsettling because on one hand you never quite know where you're landing it's you know, referencing loki uh and of course when it comes into the are, are known Celtic mythology and folklore. To me, it's very exciting because these characters, in so many cases, you simply don't know what side they're on. And mm -hmm. we see that very heartily translated in Celtic folklore in relationship to the Fae. Yeah. That is, that is a very good, um, illustration i think and i think that's one thing too that so many people they have a, a a certain idea of those concepts including the fey um that are really not what was originally viewed um and we it's so much of it is interpreted through the lens of a couple of writers and then like Disney and so forth, that when you throw these words out, some people have a certain concept that just really does not square up with what traditionally it meant. No, 
<clears throat> it it often does not. And that brings me to another uh, aspect of, of writing that I think is very, very important, which is moving our headspace away from writing fan fiction. Yeah, and, and I think, I, I think uh, writers and, and, and people in, in sort of in the, in the writing business, fan fiction has a certain uh, shorthand meaning. You might explain what we mean by that. Well, for, for me, I, and, and for the record, full disclaimer, I've written fan fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was for Star Wars. It mm -hmm. will never be seen by the light of day. Uh, it was, <laughs> I'm still, that oh, no, said, that's a challenge now. I, I, I actually treasure the fan fiction that I wrote. I'm not sure where it is. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I could reconjugate it because I remember all of it. But it uh, was really, it was really, to me, fan fiction is very powerful because it's a, an effective for young writers because mm -hmm. it's, it's a fantastic writing exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because you already have a framework to, to start with. Yes. And once in a while, uh, a great author will come along and be able to write within that framework. Mm -hmm. uh, not often, I will personally say, and that's my, just my opinion, but it can happen. And we see a lot, uh, a lot of fantasy sci-fi genres inspire a lot of fan fiction. They do, and the flip side of that is often it, it ends up being very derivative of a very small number of original writers. Yes, and I'm assuming just because human nature is what it is, that th there's always been some aspect of fan fiction ever since that there was literature, but it really, became its own uh its own weather pattern in, in in pop culture really with star trek well yes i was thinking a little further back with uh -huh. you, you know tolkien and yeah. and uh, true true lovecraft and, and, and and lovecraft to me lovecraft is really fascinating because he it, encouraged writers to use his framework as an open source that's true he did he did encourage it and 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 people have run with that but he was uh, he he was an original thinker as far as his world building Very much world, so. you know um since the early 20th century um their world building, particularly in the fantasy genre, which kind of carries over a bit into folklore themes. Yes. Um, very few have not fallen into the trap of mimicking, usually Tolkien. Agreed. And uh, I, my, my fingers are crossed that my 12 to 18 year old audience from four plus years ago will still be haunted by some of the monumentally um, emphatic lectures that I gave them about, uh, please understand if you're writing fan fiction, that you know that you're writing fan fiction and, <laughs> <laughs> and understand the limits thereof and do not mistake what you're writing for not fan fiction, if it is fan fiction. I had a lot of fun with those and uh, nobody left crying. So I considered that to be a positive, but it was, or negative. I'm not sure. Depends on your perspective, but <laughs> it, it was one, one of the most frustrating things in terms of fantasy is that there's a mass, mass derivative works of Tolkien and, yeah. and, and done, just for the record, Dungeons and Dragons do not help. Um, it, <laughs> no, it is. It's it's fine within its own structure, but it does not help. And if you bring me yet another story with orcs, 
I'm going to hit you in the head with a paper towel roll. It <laughs> just, you know, and, and, and this was one of the things, and, and of course, <laughs> for me, who does not play video games, because I'm too busy doing other things, to then have a new generational crop of kids being writing derivative works based off of video games of which I am unaware and not and this was this was the thing that I would would beat them over the heads with conceptually not physically was fine you, there is something about this material that emotionally resonates mm -hmm. and I get that but please take it enough steps further that it ceases to be fan fiction look <laughs> at the archetypal themes that are causing it to resonate with you why do you like vampires why do you like will of the wisps why do you like orcs why do you like these things <laughs> and then you know we only have the internet 90 percent of all of western civilization and a good chunk of the world's encyclopedic data is now at our fingertips and instead of using it to look up interesting things we're using it like we're using it so how about you use it to look up interesting things and actually do a couple layers of research dig into the original source material uh that inspired the people who inspired you you like the video game you like the movie you like the book go find out who these people were inspired by mm -hmm. go look up their sources go dig into their sources and play with those original sources as much as possible you know, heaven forbid that you read the poetic Eddas uh, of, of Norse mythology for yourself, rather than just stopping and writing derivative fan fiction from Thor Ragnarok, which for the record has a killer soundtrack. And I love the film. Plus it has Kate Blanchett in it as hell. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, that is great. But why do these things resonate? Let's dig as deep as we possibly can. And I think that you know, that, that, I mean, realistically, everything comes from somewhere. Uh, we're, we're all derivative to a point, but find the, the archetypal elements that truly resonate, go as deep as you possibly can into the lore and the, uh, the past civilizations as possible, and then create something of your own from those origin points. Okay, and how did you do that? <laughs> well, first of all, a lot of digging into Celtic um, fairy lore. Mm -hmm. That was the, uh, you know, full disclaimer, Play Child's Doctor does not have an orc. Um, <laughs> it does not have an orc. It does not have a dragon. So uh, there, there's, just in terms of narrative layers, really playing with the same the same origin point that a lot of people including individuals who have changed the face of cinema as we know it mm -hmm. uh have dug into which is joseph campbell carl Jung, um the the hero's journey mm -hmm. and the the hero of a thousand faces that those concepts, those elements are incredibly powerful. They are powerful because they're archetypal mm -hmm. and they're going, they resonate throughout, uh, throughout history, throughout culture, throughout geography. And there's clearly something there. So, and, yeah, and for anyone who is not familiar, particularly with Joseph Campbell, um, yes. his works basically illustrate to you why we still talk about mythology and folklore after thousands of years, why these stories resonate over time. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's those unspoken uh, things that we don't even recognize of why we are attracted to these stories and why certain stories work for long periods of time and then others are relegated to the trash bin because 
something was missing typically something was something was missing the the people they didn't dig deep enough uh why why are there plenty of sci-fi fantasy films that you can't name and then there's the original star wars trilogy mm -hmm. or or whatever yeah i yes. mean it's the, whatever and, the example is yeah and, <laughs> and and you know um in reality, I think some of my my favorite trilogies, my favorite films, in some cases books, uh, you know, work because they are tied to these much larger ancient themes and ideas. Things like, and of course, I'm going to name these, and then you know, remind everybody that yes, I'm trying very hard not to ever be derivative of them. I'm trying to dig deeper behind that. But um, of course, Lord of the Rings. Um, Star Wars, the Matrix trilogy. These are, of course, Harry Potter's just fun. Um, and I, I enjoy it immensely. But again, Hero's Journey. And uh, there are certain uh, motifs and elements of the Hero's Journey that you can find through, throughout and then play with. So digging into well, that. And, and, speci and specifically with Star Wars, the... Um... George Lucas specifically used Joseph Campbell's um, framework in writing the story. So, one hundred percent, and uh, and literally, he sat in on. He was he was a student, literally, of Joseph yes. Campbell in, in his classes. And Joseph Campbell was a student of Carl Jung, so who you know, posited these ideas of of the of of the the archetypal unconscious. The collective mm -hmm. unconscious and the these ideas are very powerful and they can be used to great effect what is something that you, i feel very comfortable that we as a human beings can can safely say is that you can use these narrative framework concepts safely without mm -hmm. becoming derivative well that's true because there are examples that have. Yes. And, and the, <laughs> the, the way I see it is the, the archetypal narrative concepts of mythology are that they, they speak to universality in the human journey. Exactly. Now, yes. a lot of what, what you did in the novel to illustrate these points was character driven. Yes, 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 it was. You, and I, yeah, go ahead. What's your favorite character? Oh my gosh, Mikhail, the satyr. Uh, <laughs> no dragons, but a satyr. Right, no dragons, but a satyr. And uh, again, I, I consistently played with a wide variety of themes of ambiguity. There are many elements within the book that you could read and go, oh, it's like this. And somebody else can read and say, oh, no, it's like that. I encourage those kind of multiple conclusions. Mm -hmm. and, and I encourage the, the readers to be engaged within that process. And if I had two of them who said, oh, it's like this, and another one said, no, it's like that, I'd say, yeah, you're both right. Welcome to Celtic Ambiguity. Uh, this is this is the nature of duality. You're welcome. Uh, welcome to the Tuatha Dé Danann, and uh, you know, tread lightly, but have <laughs> fun. Uh, Mikhail is my favorite because, first of all, he is incredibly snarky. Just as a as a, as a writing a character, he has a he's a complex past. He's incredible. He's sarcastic, and he's really not a nice person. Uh, but he's a uh, a very principled, surprisingly principled person. And he mm -hmm. says whatever he thinks. And consequently, Mikhail as a, as a character gets to say all the things that I have a tendency to think. <laughs> it's always nice to have a character that way. It is. It's very cathartic and, uh, and a lot of fun that, uh, and, and Interestingly enough, and I've heard other authors talk about this at times, but 
I, there are two characters in the book that when they showed up, be, not only got inside my head, but began to write their own dialogue. Yes, that does happen. <laughs> and, uh, and Mikhail is definitely one of them. <laughs> and um, the other? Oh, the other is, is um, Cyrus's uh, little sister, Althea. And Althea, th there's, so for two thirds of the book, I, I think I can do this without giving the, the actual narrative away. But for two thirds of the, book, of the book, Althea is what writers affectionately term as a MacGuffin. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she is the thing that inspires the quest. And right. that's not giving away too much because you have to have a quest. You have to have something initiating the story. Otherwise, you essentially have a journal <laughs> of day-to-day -day <laughs> events. Something must happen. And uh, so for people who are familiar um, in Star Wars, the original 1977 Star Wars, A New Hope, uh, R2-D2 is a MacGuffin. He's the droid with the plans. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he has the plans and the plans to the Death Star uh, and is trying to get to Obi-Wan Kenobi to try to get back to Alderaan to initiate the response of the rebellion is what sets everything else in motion. You kind of got to have a MacGuffin. It's important from a writing standpoint that you don't have too many of them. Mm -hmm. And but then from a just a purely writerly and structural standpoint, uh, the MacGuffin is an object. Mm -hmm. It's it is a thing that makes the things happen. And Althea and I, I do get very personally invested in the ethics of my of how I treat my characters, which gets a little weird because they're not real. But about halfway through writing the book, I really started feeling bad because I'm objectifying this character because. Mm -hmm. She's not in the book in any real degree. You see her through, you, you enter, she's introduced in the second chapter uh, briefly, then she disappears. Who took her? We don't know. We have ideas. Um, quest ensues because this has happened. But any interaction with Althea is, is seen through visions. And right. It is something that I do enjoy doing. I really enjoyed with this work, which it is done. It is written in first person. So the only thing that you know that anyone can actually know through as you journey through the book is the same thing Cyrus knows. It is limited right. first person. Uh, we, we do not have an omniscient standpoint. We don't flash into uh, you know, what's happening in a shady back alley of you know, <laughs> where the deal's going down. So then meanwhile, we know, then, uh, no, you know, no meanwhile. Yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, back at the camp, uh, we don't do that. We only know what Cyrus knows, but Cyrus experiences visions. Mm -hmm. uh, he has second sight. And of course, he has second sight in a family that doesn't believe in magic. And as one might imagine, being able to uh, see things and know things in a very mundane world in which that doesn't happen can lead you to question your sanity. And so that of course contributes to the ambiguity. And at the same time, we get well into the book, two thirds in, and we really have never met Althea. And I really was honestly feeling bad. Like I said, I get very personally invested in my, my people. I was feeling bad because I'm going, I, there's this girl here that, that needs to be written and we just keep using her as an object uh, because yeah. she's moving the story forward. And I feel bad about this and I don't know what to do about it. And then we finally get to the point that she is there. And it was an incredibly weird experience because she comes in as a force of nature. Uh, I don't know how much it, this necessarily translates to the reader, but certainly it was for me that she appears and inside my head as, a, as, a, as an individual with her own voice, uh, with an enormous um, uh, strength of will, and this is all, she's only eight years old, 
and she knows what she has to do. She is willing to do what she has to do, even if it's difficult. And she is in charge of herself in incredible ways that I didn't even have in my notes. And <laughs> there were points that I would write things and I would look back at it and it would emotionally impact me in, in ways, again, that I could not have anticipated because she just, again, much like Mikhail, but very different tone, showed up as her own person. And, and I think that happens with writers a lot. I think, you know, may not make sense to people who aren't writers, but it, 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 beca- it really does become its own world. Um, it does. It does. And, uh, yeah. But and I, think, I think that's what makes for, for good writing, too, because if, if, if it doesn't have that ring of reality to it, it's flat and the reader knows it it is it i i i personally feel that for myself in terms of my own artwork creation i did capture lightning in a bottle with this work Mm -hmm. uh and and which is great for the record it makes writing the next book terrifying (laughs) because how on earth are we going to duplicate that and uh getting closer yeah, I've got a lot of a lot of the moving parts and pieces, but there's there is a book too. It's just been it's being slow. Sometimes they are. <laughs> now, but, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say we 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 started a little earlier talking about the importance of the antagonist. Um, to a yes. story, and particularly a fairy tale, um, and how did you write an understandable antagonist? Oh, I, I think that that first of all, in, in order to write a good villain, you really have to give them reasonable and understandable motivations for them doing the. The things that they're doing, make them making the choices that they're making. Those choices may be unethical. Those choices may be harming our protagonist, whom we have grown attached to. But you, as the writer, have to get inside their heads and say, you know, from their perspective, I can understand them making these decisions. Mm -hmm. That creates a much more intelligently create crafted and nuanced character because it reflects real life and it also messes with your head because over the course of time we making the choices that we feel that we have to make at any given time may mean that we become the villain in someone else's story oh everyone's a villain in someone's story <laughs> And, and that's tough. Uh, we don't, it, it upset, it upsets our apple cart. It upsets mm-hmm. our, our tidy vision of life because we want to imagine that we're the hero, not only in our own story, but we're the hero in everyone's story. And, and if someone doesn't see us that way, then that must mean they're the villain. Mm-hmm. And it really messes with our perception and it, it's uncomfortable, it's deeply uncomfortable to wrap our heads around the idea that this may not be the case. I love the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skit from a British um, comedy and it's two guys, I think in, in German uniforms and they look at each other and go, wait, are we the baddies? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and, and I think that that's incredibly insightful. Now, it, you, you start going there, it will really start messing with your head. And people don't like that. But it also, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a harsh and jarring experience, much like adolescence. And it <laughs> is, it is, is, um, very painful but it is also extremely humanizing and Mm -hmm. 
done properly, I think that it can really lead us to an improved sense of empathy and an improved sense of um, global perspective. I, I mean that in terms of just being able to contextualize the world and the people around us and see the nuance of conflict that, uh, that, that exists at the same time, certainly for the case of the story, at some point you have to pull your head out of the, the rear end of relativity and say, <laughs> okay, now that we've contextualized all the reasons that these people have a reason to be making these terrible decisions, they have made these terrible decisions. They are harming people and they are the bad guys. And then you roll from there. And uh, you had an interesting vehicle for doing that in the book. It, it was now again, limited first person narrative mm -hmm. and we're dealing with a very small rural Missouri town in 1924 and so mm -hmm. our character can only know the things that he can know right he, he cannot know the things we know he can only then know the things he knows and a brightly colored um circus horse-drawn circus arrives in town June of 1924, sets up uh, with uh, gobs of enticing entertainment on the other side of town, <clears throat> and they have brightly colored wooden wagons, somewhat in the shape of barrels. They are foreigners, they're European foreigners with dark hair, they speak other languages that they, you don't know what those languages are, and they are mysterious and beautiful and exciting, and things ensue. The people, the townspeople, the Missouri townspeople refer to them as gypsies. Uh, we would often call them by, by, by the now more uh, a politically correct term, Romani, um, or contextually, uh, culturally sensitive term. But the reality, which you have to infer as you're reading the book, is that they are not Romani. Uh, they are Italian witches and their entourage. And really dug into a concept that I find vastly interesting, which is, of course, during... Um, European immigration, several hundred years of European immigration to the New World, that many individuals fled across the Atlantic because of religious persecution. And you have uh, a, oh, it's the, you know, Baskin Robbins 31 flavors of religious persecution, which, which, option would you like today there's probably a reason that someone was fleeing europe for uh, their religious beliefs or their religious practices or why it made various people uncomfortable usually from a socio-political standpoint mm -hmm. but they are that this is happening and, and of course with the uh, myriad of protestant sects that fled western europe in the 16 and 1700s. Once uh, they got to America, they could build a white church and they could uh, go to church in public and they could write down church histories and those church histories could go into the documentation of the founding of the nation. And it was very um, open in terms of, of the, the process. Mm-hmm. And, and I have, and for the record, I have uh, an enormous amount of respect for not only the narrative, but for the plight of those people at various times and what they went through in, in terms of, of mm, sacrifice uh, in, in order to achieve religious freedom and then to work to practice that religious freedom here. Now, what I think is interesting is that it can be I believe very accurately inferred that it wasn't just uh, Protestant and Catholic sects in sects in various locations in Western Europe that were fleeing various forms of religious persecution. It was also individuals who practiced other 
quote unquote religion, specifically pre-Christian pagan uh, or occultic practices. Yes. And, and to put a, a really blunt term on it, witchcraft individuals yes. uh, in Europe who are practicing witchcraft. And when you look at, uh, of course we get uh, hyper-focused on Salem and then to a degree, uh, it's, it's North America's only witch trial. We, we, need, we need to hold it close and dear to our hearts. <laughs> Besides, look what it did for Salem. Um, <laughs> it is, solved it. I know. <laughs> they, they, they founded a tourist empire. Um, the, uh, but <laughs> it's like Branson, but with broomsticks. So it... Um, I, I laugh uh, at someone that actually, actually, <laughs> his family actually went back to Salem at the trials. <laughs> I want to, I want to get to do a podcast on Salem. Just throwing that out there into the ether. Um, yeah, we, we need to do that. Yeah. Also, also Sleepy Hollow. Yes. Just throwing that out there. So, um, <laughs> But the, the reality, what I find interesting in the in the larger narrative is that in comparison, even in comparison, we 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 have a very odd uh, perspective in terms of looking at the witchcraft trials because we tend to get stuck at Salem, and then if we take mm -hmm. a step further, we mm, get bent out of shape about what was going on in Britain and Scotland, in England and Scotland going back to James the first James the sixth James the first your pick duality uh, and James uh, without really ever doing a contextual comparison point of what was going on in Western Europe in continental Europe which the witch trials that were happening in continental Europe were monumental compared to what happened elsewhere oh definitely definitely um um a lot more egregious behavior happened on the continent and across the continent, not, and not yeah. just one area, um, no. that um, the horrible things happened in, in the British Isles, but um, in comparatively um, not nearly as bad as, as the continent. And not, in comparison, not the either scale. makes, yeah, the scale is, um, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of, of people yes. tried and, and killed. Um, whereas you, you did have, you, you did, still had a fair number in, in the British Isles, but not anything like that. And then in America, basically you had Salem and you had one basically witch hunt and set of trials in uh, Connecticut uh, in the 1640s, and that's basically it. Um, yes, and it it <clears throat> to me, and this is not to this is not to um, excuse the the poor judgment of things that happened. No, uh, but when you do make a point counterpoint or comparison points of scale, there there is an interesting implication of trend that superstition uh, and fear of witchcraft was largely dying out in North America and mm -hmm. making that we were making a transition into quote unquote the modern world uh, into a more civilized um, structural society that that I find it interesting because without that context historical contextualization we can look at that and be horrified at the, you know, and, and make blanket assumptions about the psyche of the, the, the colonial era that mm -hmm. I think are unfair. And it's important to note that there were, uh, you know, authority, authorities and, and others pretty close to Salem who, when they received word of what was happening, were like, whoa, time out. Uh, mm -hmm you guys need to rethink this. This is not a good idea. Those types of responses. Oh, definitely. It, it, uh, I think the, the initial responses were um, 
you know, this has to be a mistake. Um, and then once they realized that this was really going on, you know, um, the, the broader authorities started reining it in pretty quickly. Um, yes. You know, so um, to be perfectly honest, it almost had a Lord of the Flies kind of mentality that, you know, it's, it, it was that perfect storm in, in that, one location that um, did not replicate itself elsewhere. So yes, which is a positive, and mm -hmm. and and also I think it it bears coming back to the the book, uh, the Italian traveling caravan of mm -hmm. witchcraft, who are uh, and I'll, I'll speak on those in just a moment. But they're not the only witches in the book, right? And, uh, they are the only villains who are practicing magic in the book. There are also plenty of uh, everyday people who are a bit villainous in the book that are just everyday people making terrible decisions uh, about how they treat others. But in this case, the, we have the, the, these witches. And like I said, there are other witches who, I, who are um, oftentimes quite positive in their... Uh, in their magic and engagement thereof. And that my idea is that these were, these were uh, a, a caravan of witches, a family, a matriarchal family of witches who got on the out, uh, got on the wrong side of history at the wrong time and had to flee to North America and are flee, you know, had to flee. And in so doing left uh, positions of wealth and power and privilege far behind and there's an enormous amount of bitterness in in that the idea that they have fallen uh far mm -hmm. from their station in life that they are struggling and they are bitter uh, specifically uh our, our primary villain and who is in charge of the of the caravan and uh, she is going to do and again this is a very pragmatic position which is something that i appreciate about magic is that it is very pragmatic uh she is going to do what she believes is necessary in order to maintain or hopefully reclaim her her power and also that for her uh for her line her family line mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of people in the same position would be very tempted to do. Yes, it is. And it was something that I, I worked hard to infer uh, multiple times, particularly through narrative. And there, there are points within the narrative, uh, points within the dialogue that uh, Lysiska, which is our, our character's name, uh, has conversations uh, with Cyrus, our protagonist and others, within his earshot, where it, it is to me anyway, as the writer, pretty clear that she's not making these terrible decisions, you know, the, these decisions to harm people because she particularly enjoys harming them, but this is a means to an end. And mm -hmm. she is not going to not make that decision. And, you know, that, that's something that goes back to very traditional storytelling and fairy tales and just dark storytelling in general. Um, and you did it very effectively. I'm glad. It's, uh, you know, the tagline for the book is uh, some fairy tales have no happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And it made for an incredibly fun sometimes emotional, sometimes emotionally difficult story to write. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's very, and it's very thought provoking. And that's one thing that a lot of people that I talked to that read it have said, it, it's, it makes them think, which is not cool. a bad thing. Cool. I, that makes me very happy. I, as I was rereading my notes in preparation for this week, because uh, I, I probably wrote 
40 to 60 pages of character um, mm -hmm. biography to, to create this along with additional lore building and, and world creation. That I, I was doing this in 2017 when I was really just doing, you know, following bits and pieces of research lines and personal interest in if something resonated for some reason, then I would intuitively follow it. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, but at the same time, uh, even after writing the book, I still relegated much of that into fiction, into the concept of fiction. I was just having fun. I was just creating an art piece. And then flash forward to 2020, when we began, uh, now I have two years of actual research and engagement <laughs> of, of these things, of all things esoteric under my belt. And going back to my original research, I was very surprised at how accurate much of that lore was. Well, I, I think that goes to your instincts of what, 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 did, what passed the smell test. <laughs> yes, yes. When it, when it resonate, when it resonates somewhere inside you and you go, I like this. I like this a lot. I want more of this kind of, these kind of ideas. Um, it's, it, as an artist, uh, and I think that to, to a large degree, our, our job is, as artists, is to, our, our job is to manifest reality in unique ways that are not, that is not dry, that is not textbook. Um, but it is reflecting a reality around us, sometimes on a more energetic level and uh, a more ethereal level. And sometimes we, we, we get there. Mm -hmm. And you did, so. Thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. It's available on Amazon. <laughs> That's right. Go get it. It's, you won't regret it. Oh, now I think uh, enough about me. Uh, you, <laughs> you have, have uh, you are a prolific author. And I don't know. I, I I don't know that it falls under prolific at this point. But thank you. Uh, I was I was sitting at the at the table at the metaphysical fair, and I have my lone fiction book, and then I have all of your titles in front of me. Yes, you're a prolific prolific writer. <laughs> and there's and I've said this before. I think this is a good intro because I I I stand by it. Is that you have written a series of exquisitely detailed but really fun to read regional uh texts uh, that are that really do so much to move the conversation forward on things like haunted carthage haunted joplin civil war ghosts uh route 66 from a non-kish perspective and that is, it's very difficult to, um, to, to estimate the scope of what your works are actually doing, um, because they are widely read, they are widely available, and they're extremely well researched. Now, from a, uh, from a historical standpoint, it's, it's comparatively speaking, not difficult to find um, large history texts on a variety of subjects, but they're not fun to read. Generally uh, not. Uh, conversely, it's not difficult to find regionally written uh, bits and pieces of things. Somebody says, hey, I want to write a book. And, you know, and then the book gets published. And certainly down here, I, and I'm, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because I'm talking about like over the past, you know, hundred some years uh, mm -hmm. down here, a wide variety of people over a century said, oh, people are interested in the White River Hills. Let's write a book on the White River Hills. And they do. Uh, and it's interesting. Oftentimes it's poorly constructed. 
uh, or it is poorly researched. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it is very difficult. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a narrow, um, you know, a, a pretty thin genre of having a highly researched uh, regional histories that are also really, really fun to read. There, you typically can get one or the other. It's very difficult to get, um, you know, both in one piece. Your books are that genre. They are in that where it's it is both highly researched, highly accurate, uh, extremely well done, but also not dry. A lot of fun to read. Oh, uh, I I find that I mean that's that's the sweet spot, and they are of course, extremely popular around here because people are interested in their, if, you, if you're familiar with Carthage, folks are very interested in, oh, what can I learn about Carthage, et cetera. Right. That, that, I mean, that, that's true. And, you know, it, it's funny because, and you know this, but um, my, my passion, my in writing throughout the years has other than professionally, has not been nonfiction. Uh, it's, I, I am really a fiction writer. I, someone that I actually have known for a, a number of years said to me uh, a couple of years ago, something was said about someone, we were in a conversation with other people and someone said something about some of my fiction writing that they were familiar with. And the comment was, oh, I didn't know you wrote fiction. All your books are nonfiction. And it's like, well, that's just kind of the way it happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. And of course, you know, we, we spend an enormous amount of time talking about my, my fiction work, but the bulk of my writing is nonfiction. It's for the magazine. That, that's true. That's true. So um, yeah. now tell Carol me tell me there. <laughs> um, a little bit about the, you know, first of all, uh, let's list uh, the, the book series that we're talking about. Okay. Um, first title is Civil War Ghosts of Southwest Missouri, uh, published by the History Press, uh, available Amazon, Barnes Noble, pretty much any but selling site and but stores uh, in the region, as well as like Sam's Club and Cracker Barrel and Walgreens. <laughs> I never know where I'm going to see them anymore. Um, uh, and then after that, um, Haunted Joplin, then Missouri's Wicked Route 66, Outlaws and, and Gangsters and Outlaws on the Mother Road, and then Haunted Carthage, Missouri. Yes. So uh, what, what does, and yeah, I know you know the answer to this. You know that I know the answer to this, but... <laughs> What does history have to do with ghost stories? Well, and I, I think that's, you know, a, a fair question because what I find with a lot of people is they assume, they uh, assume one doesn't have anything to do with the other. Um, as if they are expecting that all ghost stories are by nature fiction, I guess, or just fanciful or fairy tale, basically. Um, and that they are just sort of created out of thin air. But in reality, most ghost stories really are rooted in fact, in history. Uh, there are very few compelling ghost stories that aren't, you know? I mean, of course, Christmas Carol certainly is, is one, uh, yeah. but, and, but again, and even at that, the, tro the, the tropes used in it are taken from earlier ghost tales that were rooted in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I think one of the things that certainly 20th century uh, modernist viewpoints, uh, history, we tend to associate history with history class. When was the last time that you sat down in a dry history class and said, okay, we are going to explore ghost stories. It is, 
it, it is something that we again coming back to that that roman cube uh, mm -hmm. that we don't put this in that but in reality when you when you contextualize things appropriately you really can't separate them apart our history and our ghost stories are inextricably linked they they are and and and, and to be fair when when this started um I was I was approached to write the first one, and the publisher had, you know, has a series uh, called Haunted America that is all about hauntings and ghost stories, etc. And you know, looking at a lot of the titles, a lot of them were approached more from the anecdotal perspective of, you know, these are the anecdotal stories and, uh, and some firsthand, this is what happened to me. Uh, and I, I always, I felt like those kind of books only went so far. It's like, okay, so, but why, did, why? And yeah. so for me, looking at the the history is what makes the the ghost stories interesting and and compelling and so really mine have more history than they have ghost stories to be perfectly honest and and i'm gonna i'm gonna make a point a crossover point into live events because i think that there's an interesting uh narrative crossover okay that we put a lot of focus when we do live events we put an enormous amount of focus on the history of the location the history of the the home or the structure uh the history of the region these types of things uh, individuals who uh frequent or you know attend uh walk away with hopefully a, a broad knowledge of uh, uh of who came before why they did what they did uh, who built the the thing? Um, <laughs> why they built the thing? Those types those types of stories, and sometimes it surprises people because they're expecting uh, sensational, spooky thrills, and we're yeah. talking about uh, you know sociological uh, history. We're talking about why why did people come to this location why did they build a location like this what did this location mean to them oh and also some of them are most likely still here because they loved it mm -hmm. uh, and that there's a normalization in that but you also i think can get people who are maybe super into history or super into ghosts but they may not be prepared to bridge those two together very true and and one of my goals in, in with these titles was to appeal to both of those people yes and if if they came for the history and they got something out of the ghost stories even better and vice versa right and and i think that we we see that now like uh at uh, the uh no, my mind went blank. Of the town in which I live, uh, the <laughs> the old English inn and uh, uh, and the Hollister haunted walking tour that we mm -hmm. did at the beginning of October. Mm -hmm. uh, it was composed of three parts. One was about storytelling and lore, and and song and murder ballad music. Mm -hmm. One was about history. That was my part. Mm -hmm. uh, I was taking you know the, the groups down the down downing street and talking about the history of taney county and so little of what i was talking about was paranormal there, there were mm -hmm. a few things here and there i was talking about just understanding how hollister came to be and the people who made that happen and then uh you got the juicy part uh of taking people through the haunted inn and telling them the, the the documented and the anecdotal paranormal incidences that have taken place in the end and you combine all those three together and i think it's very powerful because there's, there's so many aspects of the uh the human experience in it 
and and that is that that I like that approach, and I like that we do it whether it's in writing or in events that you don't see done too often, and and it's fun. It is, it is a lot of fun. I think it it should be done more often because it is more fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's more interesting. It it does something that I think again that we. It's a it's a theme of duality and ambiguity ambiguity that we've played with a lot in, mm -hmm. in tonight's uh, episode, but I think it's easy to shy away from some of these concepts because they also hold up a mirror to our own soul. Exactly, and it's you know it's easy to, it's easy to to enjoy the ghost story when it is anecdotal and sort of. Um, divorced from reality or history um but when you're faced with again sometimes things that happened that weren't pleasant and you had someone that was an antagonist that um uh, maybe you do kind of understand why they did but you just hope that you wouldn't do it that yes. that becomes a little more uncomfortable <laughs> It, it does. And of course, with uh, your book, Civil War Ghosts, you <clears throat> particularly explore those themes because we have uh, heroes and villains on both sides. Right. And I and I think that's I think that's one thing that, again, it, it, it's, it's kind of like what you were saying about the Celtic curve versus the Roman cube. Um, we see that we see that um, on, you know, our pages a lot with dark ozarks is that people get caught up in the roman cube and um you know have their uh heroes and villains and can't see the other side um or get hung up on a little detail of something like that um and lose sight of the bigger human picture and and um I hope over time that maybe, you know, we can bend some of those corners into curves. <laughs> I I like that. I like that a lot. Now, what you know, the, it, it, I've touched a little bit about on this, but the idea that history being territorial, sometimes it being dry, sometimes it being stuffy, sometimes it feels self-important what as a history author what are your thoughts on that well we we, we have our favorite teams i mean <laughs> um whether whether it's in a war or personalities or something people we people tend to view history the way they do their football teams yes. um you know, your Chiefs fan or your Cowboys fan or, you know, and, you know, boy, if you're Chiefs fan and you don't like the Raiders or this or that, and it becomes very myopic. Um, it's very human, but it's very myopic. And I think that's, we tend to look at history the same way because, you know, oh my gosh, this had to be the right way. You know, this side, you know, this person was in the right. So everyone else was in the wrong. Um, because you start looking at the more complicated issues that there's a lot of gray in history. It's not all black and white. Then you have to accept it's the same now. And it's the same with each one of us that, um, we aren't always the guy in the white hat. All oh, right, and that that one is rough. Mm -hmm. That one is rough. There's a great line. I love this. The victors write history, mm -hmm. but ghosts tell everyone's story. I and I I think I I I think that's true because um, history is told by the victors um, and through the lens, particularly. Um, history as it comes down over eons um we don't we we don't know all the you know ins and outs and the stories of those that were vanquished and um but when a ghost 
appears, it's, to be honest, it's not usually, it's not Julius Caesar, it's not Napoleon, it's not Cleopatra. <laughs> um, generally, they are ordinary people. And their, their stories and the activity itself is usually very personal, very human that everyone can relate to. I think that's really powerful. And it, and we see that you know, even just regionally mm -hmm. um, in, in we'll, we'll just land on the Civil War. Rarely do we, I, I've, I've not heard a single, for myself, and I'm just speaking for myself, I've not heard mm -hmm. a single report of uh, Nathaniel Lyon specifically haunting anything. He may, and we may have reports on that, but for me personally, I haven't, haven't experienced that. Mm -hmm. But no, me either. We we have. I'm assuming he's in Connecticut, but that's just me, or, or unavailable for comment on this plane. The he's busy, <laughs> hazy. To try again later. But the at, at the same time, I I've heard multiple um, apparition accounts of a Union soldier a civil war soldier, a, mm -hmm. a Confederate soldier, a, a, and there is something, obviously there's something, <laughs> mind the cliche, there's something haunting about that, um, but there is also something very human about that. Here's, here's a, a brother, uh, mm -hmm. here's a son, here's a father, here's a, a farmer, Here's mm -hmm. a craftsman. Here's a, a who, for a variety of reasons, found themselves in harm's way. Exactly, and and in the end, I think I think those those stories tell not only the stories of that maybe that private, that farmer, etc., but they do tell the stories of the more famous names as well to an extent, you know, the flip side is, you know, there, there are a handful of famous people that people associate with hauntings all over the place. Um, Jesse James is one uh, that I tell you what, if Jesse James haunts every place they say he haunts, the man gets around from coast to coast. So he, he has a busy <laughs> social schedule. Yes, he is. I'd hate, I'd even hate to keep his calendar. <laughs> <laughs> you're haunting California Tuesday, Wednesday, you're in Tennessee. <laughs> but I mean, you know, and not to make light, but that that's, the, you know, there, there are a lot of places that do claim certain ghosts like that, but uh, and whether any of them are Jesse James, I don't really know, but uh, it, it's the it's the ones that someone sees out their window or you know in their living room that have the most impact it does <clears throat> it does and for good reason that's mm -hmm. because it's very personal and now and, and if Obviously, any of the subjects, once you get into the subject of history, you're going to be dealing with this. The Civil War in particular, I think, has a heightened lens focus on it. But just mm -hmm. in, regardless, the, the process uh, as an author of delineating accuracy in facts versus storytelling, mm -hmm. objective versus subjective, and in the cloud of war, in the fog of war, that's really difficult. That's before you add on layers and layers of uh, multi, multi-generational antagonism uh, and uh, readiness to argue. But even outside of that, uh, other, other topics, other subjects that you've written on, how, how do you approach that process? Well, I, you know, one, I, I try to get as, as, as try to get the, as many facts uh, as possible, just the facts, ma'am, as, <laughs> as the old TV series said. Um, but 
I, I try to look, I, I, then I try to look at the people that were involved and in, in think about from their, you know, in their shoes, what's going on, perspectives, and try to be as even-handed as possible to those people um, because I try to tell the story for the reader to understand the context of the time um, because it's always easy to just take one side or the other, but it's rarely entirely one-sided. So I, I, I try to faithfully depict both sides to the point of making them uh, real to the reader um, that these people were not one dimensional paper cutouts, you know, to time, that they had complex reasons and motives, et cetera. And how it affected what happened. And it's easy to take a very subjective point of view. That's the easy thing to write, but um, trying to give sort of equal time and weight, especially to sometimes to a to a character to a character in history or a event that is not very palatable. Yes. What, uh, just not not limiting to Civil War ghosts, but just out of, out of your body of work, what were, what were some challenging moments that came to mind, just in terms of research, separating out uh, subjectivity from objectivity? Um, well, I, I th the Civil War is, it is a big one in this region because you had such divided opinions um or i should say disparate opinions because you you had really three camps um you you had your strong union um supporters you had conditional union supporters which basically the position was let the set let the southern states do whatever they want just don't affect us here and then you had secessionists and uh because so many people have emotional opinions on all of this, even today, tied to whoever their great 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 grandfather fought for, this and that. Um, trying to explain how all these people interacted um, and, and not end up making the same mistakes, falling victim to what I was trying to avoid. Yes, that that can be that that can be hard. That and I think that's very fair. It's when you were jumping over to to Joplin, mm -hmm. uh, writing the Joplin story. What were just some of the perhaps fun or surprising things that came out of that book? Oh, um, well, in in part, just you know digging into some 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 of the places but um i think that it was surprising and not so much for me because i knew the history already but for people when i we get feedback not knowing the um sort of the bitter fighting and rivalry uh in the early days that uh, Basically, you had two towns at war and uh, you had very unpleasant um, um, hate crimes. Yes. Things like that, that people having no idea that this happened in their hometown. I, I think that's one thing that struck me is that and, I, and you know this, but how little most people know about where they live. True. Interestingly enough, it is actually at times easier for people to get into the history of another location than it is their own hometown. Mm -hmm. I will own up to the fact that 
I'm, I'm right there as well. I know a lot more about the Ozarks and my adopted hometown than I do about the town which I grew up in. But something that I have been really interested in, and we've talked, you and I have privately talked about this, we've not talked about it on the podcast, is Route 66. Mm-hmm. You chose a really unique uh, perspective on handling the research for Route 66, a bit different than pop culture tends to go with the mother road. Well, and that and that's and, and and that was very purposeful on my my part because I I wanted something that wasn't cliche and Route 66 in reality is not cliche, but a lot of what's written about it is very kitsch, very, you know, get your kits on Route 66 kind of um attitude that it's all you know roadside attractions you know big ball of yarn or whatever um and mom and pop diners and that's that's all that's all that route 66 is um and for a lot of people that's what the memory of it has become and um you know i i just was very interested in the other aspect of, well, when you're not being, you know, cute and kitsch, what is, a, what, what's hiding in the, in the weeds alongside the road, basically. And, and there's a lot, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> so, and it, again, uh, it, it involves dealing with a side of human nature that sometimes is very uncomfortable. Route 66 and then its uh, its replacement, I-44, is simply a conduit of mass uh, human movement. It is, and, and was for hundreds of years, Be um, in reality, it was um, wagon trail before that, it was Indian trail before that, it was buffalo trail before that. So um, there were, there, there was nothing new about the trail in 1926. Um, and a lot of what had happened along that route before it became a highway continued. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, transporting contraband or um, trying to, people losing themselves from their past or, um, just those those human arguments and conflicts that end up in um, bad things happening. Yes, and that, interestingly enough, may bring us around full circle. Uh, I forty four today is uh, you know a necessary conduit. We we use it on a highly regular basis. I will be <laughs> we do. driving. I will be driving on I forty four. On Saturday morning, uh, on 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 my way to uh, our book signing in Joplin, and yet a hundred years from now, uh, individuals perhaps not dissimilar to you and I may be talking about the uh, the noir past, of, for example, human trafficking on I forty four, and that was a and is a, a contemporary human. Uh, human rights issue that Mm -hmm. informed me writing my villains for Plague Child Soccer. Mm -hmm. It is, and and, and actually, yeah, you know, uh, what is uh, Route Route 44 was Route 66, uh, is a conduit. Um, Other other areas actually in the Ozarks, even more so. Um, That's another topic for another day, but, these kind of these kind of stories are not created now. Uh, these kind of stories have gone on since the beginning of time, um, yes. and the old adage of those who don't learn history are bound to repeat it. 
it's cliche because it's true in a lot of respects that uh, people are shocked and dismayed. Oh my gosh, how do these things happen? And you know, this this has never happened. Well, yes, it has. Um, you just weren't you just weren't paying attention. Very very true. Very. <laughs> very true. <laughs> Oh, this has been a fun episode. It has. It has. So anyone who wants to come out Saturday, you are more than welcome to do so. We would be happy to uh, talk further. And um, let's see, don't forget to check out upcoming events. We've talked about the ones um, coming up Saturday. Check out the merchandise on docozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. And thank you again to Always Buying Boats and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping us bring the dark Ozarts to everyone. Now, on the next episode, we are going to be discussing the dark Yule, the dark Yule Christmas season. Catch Dark Ozarks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other podcast platforms. And thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the dark Ozarks.